Digital characters. A revolution in visual effects. Have you ever wondered how they're created? From the mummy, through Jar Jar Bings, to Avatar, and the Hulk. Check out how hyper-realistic digital characters are created by the VFX industry's geniuses. When talking about the beginnings of digital characters, or even digital visual effects as a whole, it all comes to one company. Industrial Light and Magic. It's where, under George Lucas's visionary leadership, computers started to be used in visual effects creation process. The talented people of ILM were always a problem solvers and inventors. And so the first digital character was a response to a technical and creative problem brought to them with the movie Young Sherlock Holmes. It was 1985 when ILM used computers to bring to life a stained glass night. Dennis came over to us and said, why don't we try it in computer animation? And this was very innovative and, and very forward thinking. It was really exciting. I mean, it was a lot of work because back in the day we didn't have the tools. I literally had to take the footage and project it onto my computer screen and I matched, animated the camera move by hand. I don't know if I've ever worked harder on six shots in my life, but it was worth it because when young Sherlock Holmes came out, people who worked in the special effects industry had no idea how it was done. Their work has been nominated for an Oscar and became foundations of modern visual effects. Soon after they have created another digital character for the Abyss, and later, the Liquid Metal Terminator. After that came Jurassic Park with digital dinosaurs, followed by The Mummy, where motion capture was used for the first time, and Star Wars Phantom Menace with Jar Jar Binks, one of the main characters being digital. We'll go through the stages of the digital process and check how the artists at Industrial Light and Magic resurrected a mummy. I'll focus on the mummy because it is a milestone in the history of digital characters. But we'll also check how the techniques and technology has evolved through years. Usually, the digital characters start their life on a piece of paper. Concept artists and creature designers prepare sketches and paintings of the character. On this stage, it's easy and quick to make changes and include input from producers or director. Those artists have the most influence on how the character will look like. The concepting stage can end at 2D drawings or continues in 3D either by preparing physical sculptures or with the use of 3D modeling software. The next step is putting the two-dimensional concept art or the reference sculptures into digital 3D space. Modeler recreates the character basically by sculpting it, this time digitally, using the appropriate software. Detailed sculptures of organic objects are today usually made with ZBrush. This is a complex process requiring artistic skills. After the model is finished, it needs to be rigged. This is a more technical stage of the process. What rigging means is basically adding a skeleton to the model with a bunch of controllers, which will be used later by an animator. The rig transfers the animated movement to the mesh of the model. Polygons are automatically transformed and displaced. Without the rig, it wouldn't be possible to animate the character, as you would have to manually modify the mesh. The rig can be simple, controlling arms, legs, and head movement, or a very complex, which will allow to animate fingers or the face of our character. However, before jumping to animation, there's one more technical step to consider. Creating a muscle system. This step is not necessary, and you could already start animating your character. But to achieve more realism, especially if bare body is visible, you would want to add muscles. Imadep, from The Mummy, was probably the first digital character to receive a muscle system. 
1999 there was no software to help with the process, so ILM had to create it from scratch. Normally, you don't have to build a lot of excess complexity into the character. You can, you can pretty much use the simple case for shoulder joints, for elbows, for knees, for all those kinds of things. Uh, in our case, you were going to be able to see all the bones, so they had to move the way a real skeleton moves. So the very next step after the, the skeleton is getting the muscles to work correctly. Basically what we did is we took the, the, the skeleton, the, the correctly articulated skeleton, and we added the muscles onto it in such a way as that they connected up to the right places. Like we would connect the bicep to the right places on the arm, connect the forearm muscles, the, the brachioradialis, the, the triceps on the back would connect to the, to the scapula and to the back of the arm as well as down to the elbow. We just basically followed, you know, anatomy books, followed the assembly diagram, if you will. So the, the research and time involved to create this guy was, was astronomical, involving months of work. Uh, probably about two or three months for, for myself alone, plus uh, months of the people that were helping. This is kind of the, the completed muscul musculature on the, on the, uh, the character of Imhotep. Uh, as you can see, the, the, a lot of the muscles have been done fairly successfully, especially if you look in between his shoulder blades. You can see how as he pulls his arms back and so on, they, you get the bunching and stretching that you would really get on someone's back. Uh, his, his thighs flex accurately. His arms flex when he, when he rotates his, his wrist. You can see the forearm muscles all twist naturally around the bones. So we were pretty happy with this. With the muscle system ready, the character goes through a stage called skinning. What it means, is that the body of your 3D model, is stretched over the muscles. Thanks to that, we're able to see physically accurate, body deformations, and muscle shapes working under the skin. Okay, this was one of our first tests of our skinning software. This is software that was developed by John Anderson here. Uh, and basically what it does is it takes the outer skin of a creature and the skeleton of a creature and all the muscles that are inside and it fills that volume between the skin and the bones with virtual flesh. So what happens is, is that, is that the, that outer, the gray skin that you're seeing here is the outermost part of the, of the virtual flesh. The bones would be the innermost part and then all the muscles which I built and animated and made move properly are embedded within that flesh. So what that gets us is that is that the skin stays over the muscles and the bones without us having to do anything other than put it there. See, the, the movement on that gray skin, none of that's coming from any kind of animation other than procedural animation coming from the software. One of the trouble with conventional methods for creatures is that if you put lots of layers over top of each other and then move them around, they'll pop through and they'll, I mean, they'll show through and then they'll pull back and, and it really gives itself away as CG. Whereas with this, the skin stays over the, button, the muscles and the bones and you can actually see muscles and things sliding underneath the skin. And we don't have to actually do it the hard way. We don't have to fake it. It just, it just happens. Today, it's an industry standard to have characters with muscles reacting physically correct to moving and stretching. Weta Digital pushed this technology forward while working on the avatar. The half-naked characters of the movie wouldn't look as convincing as they do without an accurate body and muscle physics. Weta's digital tissue system is not just muscles. They've aimed for extreme realism by adding also layers of fat and hair system. All those elements react to each other's movement. The, the tissue can be used to create like skeletal, you know, like muscles, or it can be used to create skin or fat, tendons. And so the one tool set, we, we describe all the layers with it. So typically a creature has um, a bunch of these tetrahedralized muscles with fibers in. They also have a fat layer and a skin layer, and they have tendons and other bits and bobs, and a fascia layer. And all that's basically simmed together to produce the final cached polygonal outer model that's sent to the renderer. On top of that, complicated physics simulations are controlling correct reactions to gravity, forcing the skin and muscles to wiggle and shake while performing movement. The outcome is incredible. The rigged model of a character can now be passed to an animator. With an asset prepared like this, the artist can start his work. Animation is a traditional way of adding performance to digital characters. The quality and realism of the animation depends of course on the skills and experience of an artist. However recently, more and more often, motion capture is being used. This allows to transfer not only more realistic movement but also the style and performance of an actor. 
To help make the decrepit CG mummy believable, as an otherworldly version of Emotep, ILM Motion captured Arnold Vosloo, the actor playing the leading role. Motion capture is where you take a uh, performer of some type and you track the various positions of their body using a computer to basically try to correlate in three-dimensional space uh, where they are and where the parts of their body are, which sounds like a lot of complicated gobbledygook. And, uh, but the, the basic way that it's done is that you use some kind of markers, either a magnetic tracker or a, uh, a, a little, it's kind of like a, a ping pong ball with reflective tape on it. And you can track that using uh, optical cameras. We use infrared cameras to bounce light off of these little tracking balls that are placed all over the uh, actor's body. And by using seven cameras in a big room, we can use the computer to correlate where each ball is. Seven cameras see a ball, they know that's the same ball. They can then triangulate uh, using relatively simple geometry to figure out where that ball is on any given frame. So as someone walks through a space with all these tracking markers all over them, what we do then is crunch all those numbers and what we end up with is a position of the knee, a position of the foot, a position of the elbow, a position of the shoulder, everywhere on his body and then we have our own software which constructs that back onto a skeleton and we can then reconstruct that motion in three dimensions and map just about anything we want onto it. Later, the team would apply his movements to a digital mummy that had layers of CG muscles, tendons, and tissues carved out of digital models with painted displacement maps. This was the first ever film where a principal actor was motion captured and that data was applied to a CG character. Back then however, the captured data covered the basic movement of the body. Details, like hands and fingers, or face, were still animated manually. Today, with better technology, motion capture is especially useful for capturing facial expressions. It allows to capture details, to a level, not reachable by an animator. However, motion capture data usually needs processing, and sometimes changing. For example, to transfer a human face onto some fantastic creature, the face features have to be mapped accordingly, and perhaps tweaked. This is also being done by animators. Petty pace. From day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time. Emotep from The Mummy obviously didn't need any hair, but usually that's another, very important part of the character creation process. We can check how industrial light and magic handled that in Warcraft. Adding hair, fur, and feathers to the digital character can be a challenge. Not only the hair have to look realistic and react to physics, but also they need to be groomed and stylized. Haircraft was a tool that was invented specifically for the challenge of tackling the multiple hair grooming styles, um, braids, fur that our characters had on the show. King Magni in particular had a extremely long beard of matted red hair. It went down beneath his waist, looped back through a belt buckle, and had to carry the true weight and dynamic properties that the hair of that length would. Hair are being created with particles, filling required areas with thousands or even millions of single elements. Then, they are manually stylized. In recent years, a special position was created to take care of those tasks. A grooming artist. A final step of digital character creation process is of course, rendering. All the animated models need to be covered with shaders and textures. Accurate lighting needs to be applied. This step is crucial for a photorealistic outcome. Skin shaders are being created, taking into accounting all sort of nuances, like imperfections, blood flow, micro hair, and many others. Hundreds of hours of work are spent on all the details. Lately, real-time render engines are being used for character creation. Sometimes, just for quick preview, during motion capture sessions. But the quality got so good, that it's possible to even create final renders in real-time. I believe, this area, will be gaining a lot of attention in the future. Especially, with the new ray-tracing graphic cards, and machine learning techniques. Unreal Game Engine, is already capable, of delivering impressive quality like this. Insane amount of work is being put into digital characters creation. 
This area of VFX is being extensively developed in recent years, breaking its limitations. We can be sure that soon digital characters will reach a level where you won't be able to distinguish them from real actors. The Mummy and Industrial Light and Magic's innovations have laid foundations for this revolution. Thank you for watching the video. If you'd like to get more interesting videos about VFX and its history, don't forget to subscribe.